Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. Hi, guys. Welcome. Welcome to everyone. This is Dr. Katie Carter, and I'm a naturopathic physician for 37 years, been utilizing therapies in my practice for that amount of time that will stimulate the body to heal itself. So I met these two very innovative and brilliant young physicians and, and PT, uh, two doctors, and I want to introduce them. And I want to tell you how I found them is that I, w- I wanted to incorporate some of the things that they were doing. And so I talked to both of them and they both had an interest in meeting the other ones. So first I'm going to introduce Dr. Yoshi Ram who's a, a DO, and he is the owner and run, runs the infamous clinic down in Glendale, California, Oasis Family Medicine. And I heard a couple videos on, on you, Yoshi, and was really uh, just needed to pick your brain. So I gave you a call, and I thought that I'd record this. And the same thing happened with Dr. Mike Belkowski, who is anything and everything red light therapy. He's an innovator. He's a researcher. He's a, he produces an amazing product. And I had a lot of questions for him as well. So then I wanted to introduce the two of them. And I really want to bring more to the public and also to our patients and other physicians who are utilizing things in nature to help our body to heal itself. Because we do have a vital force that can be utilized And of course, that should be our first thing that we do with all of our patients. So let's move on. And I I think you guys had some things that you wanted to talk to each other about. So I'll let you ask the first question, Yoshi. Thank you so much for having us. And yeah, the goal is just to uh, spread good information and also to learn from each other, right? I always say the more I learn, the more I realize that I don't know very much. (laughs) So it's like this ever... It's just an unending endeavor. So happy to be here and looking forward to it. And Mike, I, you know, I'm just meeting you. I just hopped on your, is it, I want you to say your website, please, where you sell some really awesome products. (laughs) Is it biolite.shop? Exactly. Biolite.shop. Yeah. um, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit about methylene blue, your red light. Oh, yes, please. My first question actually is about the Leuco methylene blue, because I have been, I've been using methylene blue in my practice for a good four years, I want to say. So it's become all the rage in the last two or three years, I feel like. Um, So I kind of got on that bandwagon a little bit earlier than most, but you know, it's been I have been learning more and more about it myself the last couple of years, been running a couple of studies, small studies on it. But tell me more about leukomethylene blue, because I'm I'm familiar with it on a scientific standpoint. I didn't even know it was available to uh, to use. So (laughs) maybe if you could just explain what it is first and they can chime in if needed. Sure. I, I kind of came upon it serendipitously. The guy that helps me create a lot of these cutting edge, high quality products, not not the red light therapy panels, but these other products, like we have a skincare cream that has a laundry list of amazing anti-aging, photo enhancing properties. So he helped me create a skin cream. He helped me create the bio blues. He's he's like a biochemist. He's a genius in a lot of ways. I actually released an episode with him today on my podcast. It's the fifth time he's been on because he's he's a... People love listening to all the technologies he's building, like not not to go down too many rabbit holes, but one of the products he's releasing is basically it's called Viopack with a V. So like violet, like the violet light. So instead of wrapping your your produce in this clear saran wrap, it would be more of an opaque violet-ish packaging that as the light comes through that packaging, it emits a violet light on whatever's inside of it and enhances the quality and longevity of whatever is being wrapped. So he does this type of stuff with, and he's going to use that with like band-aids. He's going to use it for like things that hold blood. So anything that light passes through, whatever's inside of it, the vibration is enhanced. So that's just how his mind thinks. And he's into textiles. He's into limitless things as far as enhancing biophotonic technology. But regardless, so that's kind of this guy. Uh, He helped me create the bio blue. 
And we were, to bring this full circle with the leucomethylene blue, we were going down a path of creating a uh, another product where I didn't want the stain of the blue, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, is there a way that can be avoided? And I was listening to, I think it was Chris Masterjohn, and he was talking about this quote unquote transparent version of leucomethylene or methylene blue called leucomethylene blue. It's the reduced version. There's more electrons. And if you look at the powder color differences, it's very stark in the contrast. Methylene blue is like this dark, 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 dark green color, more or less. And then when it's, once it's put in water, it turns that beautiful royal blue, which is why I chose this shirt. And then I thought um, you just got got it stained this morning. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well played. And then when you look at the leucomethylene blue powder, it's like a white limish green and it's like, wow, what a, what a very different appearance from methylene blue and leucomethylene blue. But again, so we were going down the path of creating this other product that we haven't created or released yet. And it turned out the concentration that we needed to utilize with meth- uh, the leucomethylene blue was so low. I was going to have so much of this expensive leucomethylene blue powder left. I just learned more about it. And it's like, well, hey, as I was learning... When you ingest methylene blue, your body reduces it into leucomethylene blue already. So, okay, for people who are either have kidneys compromised, liver compromised, this is a good option. For those in the biohacking world, always looking for like that next level cognitive boost. Well, methylene blue takes, I mean, you can argue 30 minutes to two hours for it to reach its peak plasma concentration. So it takes a little while, but you still get a nice cognitive boost. Whereas leucomethylene blue... It doesn't have to be processed. It's like an instant antioxidant hit. It's an instant cognitive boost. And so as an anecdote, again, I don't, there's really not a ton, ton of research on leucomethylene blue. I mean, there's not a ton of research on methylene blue relative to photobiomodulation. I'm used to like dozens of articles coming out every day. So it's not like there's a ton of information, but anecdotally, I had a friend who I had him start using methylene blue right away. He noticed that cognitive boost. He wasn't getting that left lethargy in the mid afternoon. He's a, he's a guy that sits in front of a computer, like all day, all night, doesn't get outside very often. So he's like a perfect modern day human being right (laughs) right away. He noticed that boost with methylene blue and he was using that for about a month. And it was like a godsend for him and his energy levels and his productivity. And so then I said, this was around the time I released the leucomethylene blue and he started using that. And it was like a compounded, uh, not accelerated, enhanced vibration of methylene blue like again he was a perfect spokesman or a spokesperson for it being like an instant hit even further enhanced energy levels and lasted i wouldn't say it lasted longer but the energy was enhanced and it was more instant i guess speaking to the the chemistry of leucomethylene blue so Um, what what kind of dosages like if you were 10 10 milligrams of the we call it just normal methylene the non-leuco version the normal flavor what yeah the normal flavor what's the kind of equivalent as far as you can tell i understand it's kind of a newer realm i've just been doing the same Mm -hmm. gene it happens quicker and the effects are actually a little bit better it seems theoretically right and that's a good question because just like i heard you speaking about and i I even bought some of those proscription trochees way early on in my methylene blue journey and the whole thought process behind that is like you circumvent the liver go straight into your bloodstream so it should be like a a quicker and better effect which begs the question is that true if it's if it's methylene blue and it still has to be reduced to leucomethylene I and mean, that's a question for right. you like this is i'm not the expert here on methylene blue that's certainly you so that'd be my first question secondarily there does seem to be some additional properties like i i can't speak about this on the top of my head i have to look it up i have it here leucomethylene blue so it's the reduced form of methylene blue having lower toxicity because you're getting rid of further getting rid of any metals and toxicities that would that's left in methylene blue granted even pharmaceutical grade is going to have a little bit left right but leucomethylene blue is further reduced has a lower toxicity higher bioabsorption instant antioxidant effect and it works as a cyclic and regenerative antioxidant does that mean anything to you yoshi off the top of your head because i think that's another differentiating factor from leuco versus methylene blue yeah, Isn't I don't. It's blue, a really good question. Regenerative antioxidant. It's a really good question. I've wondered about this for a couple of years, frankly, because 
you know, my understanding, and I, I am not a scientist, I'm more of a clinician. So thank you for calling me an expert. <laughs> but I'm also not I am I'm learning here as well. But, you know, my understanding is you t- someone takes methylene blue, the non luco version, right, it gets processed, I do it intravenously a lot in my okay. office. So it, that's not I'm not like a Oh, you, everybody has to be doing an IV, but we do do that sometimes because it's exquisitely useful, especially in things like UTIs, especially chronic UTIs. I mean, you give someone an IV methylene blue and then put some red light, infrared light over the bladder area, and it's just like that thing is gone, even if it was resistant to right. antibiotics or something else. So it's very powerful to do it intravenously. But then it's like once it's processed in the body, it's going to it once it once it's processed and then it, once it goes into that mitochondria for instance and i want to get back to like all the different mechanisms of actions of yep. meth- methylene blue because i think there's a little bit of everybody's like mitochondria and infection but there's actually a few others as well so it's it's like because it's this recycler i i liken it to like it pitches an electron and then it also accepts electrons once it's in the mitochondria and i think there's there's so much out there where it's like such and such is good, such and such is bad, right? But it's all, it's like, it's so important to remember in the body that at certain points in times and in certain tissues, we might need something like an oxidative burst or reactive oxygen species or not, right? And so I I feel like methylene blue has this really exquisite ability to just kind of be what it needs to be at whatever point in time, which is an unusual property for most substances. And Versus so, everything being a nail and the methylene blue is a hammer. Exactly. Or adaptable. It's more versatile in a sense. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the direct answer to your question, I don't know, but um, I do just for the listeners that maybe in Please chime in, Mike, wherever I miss something, because there's so much to talk about methylene blue. But so if we're going to like just the mechanisms of actions, kind of mentioned it's a mitochondria thing, but I'd also like to mention, from my understanding, it actually changes, it has the ability to change the formation of the red blood cell or the, the, the heme, which has iron in it. And so most people are familiar with the red blood cell carries oxygen, O2, on it, right? And the reason that methylene blue is used in the ER for carbon monoxide poisoning, for instance, at least part, at least part of the reason is because methylene blue has this ability to actually change the shape of the red blood cell to create a, it just enhance the ability of it to carry oxygen to whatever tissues it's going to, right? Is that, are you on board yep. with that? Would you yep. have anything to add to that particular part? Not necessarily. That's not when I learned about methylene blue, I was like really down the rabbit hole of mitochondrial health, how it's affecting that. Like you've alluded to on multiple other podcasts, like this innate ability to go where it needs to go. And that's like one of my questions to you almost yeah. is it's such like a almost an esoteric verbiage to use in a scientific mm-hmm. realm, this innate sense. Cause it's like, how do you prove that or how is that borne out in reality? So My question to you would be, at this point, I'm sure you guys have heard of Methylene Blue, especially if you've been listening to this podcast, you guys have heard me shout from the mountaintops the many benefits of Methylene Blue. So Methylene Blue is a major, major mitochondrial booster. It has a lot of similar properties as red light therapy, but they actually work slightly differently as far as how they derive their benefits to the mitochondrial function. A couple of my favorite aspects include the fact that when you ingest it, the majority of the Methylene blue ends up in your brain. So that's why you see these amazing cognitive, mental energy boosts from methylene blue. It can even stave off or prevent or reverse some types of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. This is my second favorite part about it. The methylene blue has this innate sense to help cells that have the most mitochondrial dysfunction first before helping other cells. So not only does it help cells that need the help most, but again, most of the methylene blue ends up in your brain where, as you all know, that is the most mitochondrial dense tissue in the body. Thus, that's why you see all these 
these amazing benefits with the brain with methylene blue. And then thirdly, red light therapy and methylene blue are major synergists. So of course you have your independent benefits when you just use methylene blue or red light therapy. But when you combine them together, you amplify the benefits of one another and you get the synergistic response. So anyone that's interested in red light therapy should at least be considering or looking into the many benefits of methylene blue. And as you know by now, if you've been listening to this podcast, my company BioLite has recently released an enhanced methylene blue product that includes certain ingredients like NMN that further boost the energy production of the mitochondria. It also enhances the photodynamic activity already associated with methylene blue by including colloidal gold, colloidal silver, which have their own antimicrobial or cognitive benefits, silver and gold respectively, but they also have their own photodynamic benefits as well. So again, you're amplifying the benefits of red light therapy when you ingest BioBlue. Lastly, fulvic acid helps you absorb anything that you're consuming when you're also taking it with fulvic acid. So it drives everything deeper into the cells. When you take BioBlue, it helps further absorb the methylene blue, the NMN, and the colloidal gold and silver. So you get this enhanced methylene blue product with BioBlue. And so of course, for my loyal listeners, especially you guys that have listened this far into the ad in the middle of the episode here, I'm going to give you guys an exclusive 15% discount on your order of BioBlue. And you can apply that to a single pack or a double pack or a four pack or a 10 pack. And of course, with a larger quantity, you actually get an increased discount. Simply use coupon code BioBlue15 at checkout. That's BioBlue15 at checkout. And you can snag that 15% discount discount off your order of BioBlue. So if you're interested in seeing what all of the excitement around methylene blue is about from its ability to improve cognition, energy, improve mitochondrial function, and furthermore help mitigate or prevent things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and depression, pain, cancer, go ahead and give BioLite's methylene blue enhanced product BioBlue a shot and see what you notice, especially when you combine it with your red light therapy treatments. What gives methylene blue this innate sense like is it just attracted in a certain way, or how would you explain that? I mean, so much of disease, specifically, right? Yeah, so much of disease is wherever the energy is not being made, right? Our body, when it has enough energy or ATP, tends to heal itself very well. And so if we have certain tissues, certain tissues have more mitochondria than others, certainly, but there's so much in the there seems to be more and more evidence, I should say, towards it helping neurological conditions. Well, nerves, brain tissue, like there's a lot of mitochondria there. And so I think it's more just any area that is metabolically inflexible or metabolically deficient, like that's where the methylene blue is going to go, be obviously useful. So that's my take. Would you have anything to add on to that from what you've learned? No, I mean, that makes exact perfect sense. It's just, it's such a gift that there's something out there that's able to do that and and to compound its benefits. And this is like maybe a good segue into this topic is it's a, it's a very safe, low risk, high reward. And that's kind of how I explain red light therapy too. Low risk, high reward, red light specifically, non-pharmacological, non-toxic, non-invasive. You have nothing to lose essentially if, if you use it properly. And even if you don't, it's not like you're going to end up with a negative consequence. Um, so my question to you with methylene blue specifically is, A, what's a typical dose for like if you want general overall health and wellness, general overall mitochondrial health? B, how much is too much? And then C, from like a perpetual use case scenario, like where someone who's into anti-aging longevity, mitochondrial health, what have you, is it safe to use this every day? Is there any toxicity we have to be concerned about? I don't think there's been really any studies from using it day in and day out, but maybe you could. I have one yeah. more question to that. Have you also adding, piggybacking on Mike's questions, have you found that when you started methylene blue, that there's some sometimes some sort of a healing crisis or some unpredictable response to it that maybe doesn't mean that you've overdosed them, but that that you you find something happens to somebody and then you lower the dose and then it sort of dissipates and then you can raise the dose up again? Yeah. That's yeah, great, question. great questions. So to your, all four. Yeah, yeah, yeah so exactly. All all right. Help keep me on track. <laughs> I didn't take my leukomethylene blue today. <laughs> I want to get some of that. So 
Yeah, some therapy in our office and ozone can definitely give you that healing crisis response where it's a little bit too much of a good thing for some people. I have not come across that with methylene blue. And to your kind of before you ask your questions, Mike, yeah, I'm always constantly like with everything, whether I'm prescribing a a prescription drug, pharmaceutical, or whether it's uh, an herb, it's, it's always this balance of what are the potential pros of whatever we're suggesting versus what are the potential cons. And I feel like methylene blue has over these past four years really proven itself just from an anecdotal sense in my practice to be this, there's like the ceiling is really high in terms of what it could do beneficially for someone. And the potential cons are just really, really low. And that, and I will Katie, we spoke about this a few days ago, but in the beginning, I'm I'm much more of a like try to do things as naturally as possible. And so methylene blue, it's not like we have a deficiency of methylene blue in our body, right? It is a synthetic substance. And so initially I was very hesitant, like, okay, am I going to be recommending this to this many people for this much, this many conditions? So I kind of really eased into the methylene blue. I didn't just like hop on the bandwagon and slam everybody with it. But over time, it really has borne out in my practice. This is really safe, such little downside, which then we get into the dosing. So I've just become very comfortable with it over time. And then kind of to your dosing questions. So in my practice, I have found, and I did a lot of reading initially a few years ago on this, and I've found that there's some very sensitive people who four milligrams a day kind of seems to be enough, where they're just not getting any benefit, any noticeable added benefit by taking more than that, somewhere in the four or five like kind of less than 10 milligrams in a day. I feel like most people seem to love, most of our patients seem to love 10 to 15, 10 to 20 milligrams in a day. Again, it's just like they can take more. There's just not any added benefit that they notice. Now, on the higher end of the dosing, I would say that some people definitely have found, like from an oral sense, 60 milligrams, they're like on that regularly. I remember one, heard someone talk about a Russian study from a few years ago where they were giving mice like 50 milligrams per kilogram. So, which is, it's way more than anybody would really recommend, right? So just to give an idea kind of the standard in the industry, so to speak, uh, is somewhere between half a milligram to what, four milligrams per kilogram. That's kind of the, which I'm approximately 75, 80 kilograms. So four milligrams for me would be 300 ish milligrams in a day. Now I've, I mean, I've tried that a couple times. I would not say I noticed anything exceptional on that. That's kind of the upper limit of what I would ever recommend for someone. But in that Russian study, they compared 15 milligrams per kilogram, which is, again, huge Hi. dose. And it did not change their micro, their gut microbiome after like a month, I think it was, versus the 50 milligrams did. It changed their gut mm-hmm. microbiome a lot. So it's kind of because... Better or worse? Worse. Mm. Worse. So in terms of like wiping out the microbiome or yeah, yeah, because the methylene blue has this anti-infective property as well. That's what it was very first. That's it was the first patented drug in the US over a hundred years ago, right? As an anti-infective. And so there's a little bit of this worry. Okay, if I take too much methylene blue, is it gonna destroy my gut microbiome? Is it kind of gonna be an antibiotic type of effect? Mm -hmm. Where yeah, maybe you're killing some bugs off that should be killed off, but what are we doing to our natural gut microbiome? And just from that study, it was very interesting after a month at 15 milligrams per kilogram, which is just like, it's way over a thousand, whatever that is, like a thousand ish. Crazy high. Crazy, crazy high. Still after a month, it didn't affect. Now these are in mice. So, you know, how do you want to extrapolate that to humans? Maybe you can't, maybe you can a little bit. So the point is, what I also wanted to share, I had 
I have had a couple of patients who are trying up in the 60, 80, 100 milligram dosing. And after a while, their guts seemed to be um, disturbed. So I would say it probably caused them some dysbiosis. Only other side effects I've ever seen was actually somebody who was taking the troche continuously, and they kind of had poor oral dentition to begin with. It, I think it was too much of an oxidative effect on the oral mucosa, and it made things worse. Now, in, 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 we kind of narrowed everything else out, so I think it really was the methylene blue. However, I also, I'm also aware there was a study where someone was, I think they were taking oral, like troche methylene blue, and it helped after chemotherapy mucositis. So sometimes after chemotherapy, your oral mucosa will get really inflamed. And methylene blue in that case actually helped. Now, what maybe the root causes were a little bit different, but nevertheless, those are the only side effects I've ever seen after like three and a half, four years of using methylene blue in practice. So I don't know if that answered all of your questions, but just to kind of give an idea, I will say in our practice, we kind of have this standard. If someone's getting an IV methylene blue, we start with 10 milligrams. And then the second time, if they need it, we'll go to 20 milligrams and then we'll go to 30 milligrams. I've also had some patients who, you know, they're there are individuals who are suffering with like long standing Lyme disease, long term mold exposure issues, who maybe have been on the kind of the biohacking or integrative medicine type of front for a while and are very familiar with ozone and dermethylene blue. And a few of them have just sweared upside up one side and down the other that the higher doses, like 50, 60 milligrams, really do give them more benefit. But that's few and far between. But again, we're talking about people who are kind of really metabolically, like probably having a hard time oxygenating their tissues, which of course, methylene blue helps oxygenate the tissues or at least, yeah, in many, in a couple different ways. And in terms of like athletes and people who are just wanting to up their game a bit, are you finding that the lower doses that people even find a difference or is it beneficial? Do you think? Yeah. I'd be curious on Mike's opinion on this, but I would say for those kind of individuals who are, their health is just better than the standard American to begin with. I think my, my take is that those kind of dosages are still helping people. It'll be like a more of a nootropic, right? They'll feel a little bit better. Their brain will be a little bit more turned on. So even in those healthier individuals who are metabolically more capable it's still helping them. And I think, you know, I think it goes back partially to, it's like a hundred years ago, there were not nearly as many toxins in this world. Yeah. Now our world is just full of toxins. It is impossible to not get toxic. And so many of these toxins, various types of toxins are affect different points in the mitochondria. And so if we have this methylene blue, again, it's a synthetic product, but if we have it, and it can go in and kind of bypass some of the complexes and make the oxygenation easier, give electrons to that electron transport chain easier, all with the goal of creating more energy in the form of ATP. You know, I think that's I think that's why it's beneficial uh, from a symptomatic standpoint, even for those individuals who I would call healthy. Mike? That's exactly what I was telling Katie when we first talked is like, she asked me like, why would a person need, I don't, I forget the exact question, but my, I had the exact same answer. It's like, of course our bike, like you alluded to Yoshi, we don't have a, a, a methylene blue deficiency, but we live in a modern world. We're bombarded with environmentals, environmental stressors left, right, and center. So you, in this world, you do need some tools and some arrows in your quiver, if you will, to combat and mitigate the non-native EMFs, the 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 food, the lack of being outside, the lack of touching earth, the lack of getting full spectrum sunlight on a consistent basis, like people were getting 100, 150 years ago normally, right? Same thing with red light therapy. It's the same story. Like we wouldn't need red light therapy devices, or they didn't, of course, back when everyone was farming, back when everyone was, you know, outside all day, every day. So we just live in a different world and and that necessitates, you know, having having some tools in your arsenal because the mitochondria are environmental sensors so when your environment mismatches 
your mitochondrial genome, that's when we come down with low energy, dysfunctional mitochondria, diseases and cancers and so forth. But just back to the dosages quickly, just to speak on that. So I've been doing about 10 milligrams twice a day for for many, many months at this point. I don't know. Do you use it daily, Yoshi, yourself? Oh, yeah, that was a, that was a question. I, I So I don't use anything day, every day of the week. I always recommend to everyone just taking one or two days off each week. But with the methylene blue, I mean, again, I don't I haven't seen any reason not to do it every day. It's just kind of standard protocol. I like to give everybody's body a little bit sure. of rest from everything one or two days a week. Yeah, that makes total sense. And so what I noticed initially, because I started using it last summer, generally healthy, like I'm not trying to heal anything per se, just, you know, being proactive and, and keeping myself healthy for as long as possible. But what I did notice was during my trail runs, once I was like a week or two into using the methylene blue, like my endurance was significantly better, like for no particular reason other than I was taking methylene blue. So, which makes sense, right? Like my energy is a little more optimized, a little more oxygen in the tissue. So my endurance capacity was was higher. And then secondarily, from an anecdotal perspective, there's been three instances now where I've either felt the symptoms, the very initial stages of getting sick. So then I quadruple or quintuple my normal dosage. And so two of those times were like just the very beginning of feeling sick. And both times by doing that for a couple of days, I nipped it in the bud, never got sick at all. The most recent time, about a month ago, out of nowhere, I was traveling in Seattle and I got hit hard with a virus. I was like from 100 miles an hour to zero in like an hour or two. I was hit hard. Same thing. I like quintupled my dosage for a couple of days and a virus that probably should have lasted a week or two was gone like 40 hours to the hour. So wow. and I was using the leukomethylene blue because that's what I happened to bring with me during that trip. So that kind of bears proof that the leukomethylene blue works in a similar fashion from an antiviral perspective. But like those are my, like I can speak to some pretty awesome benefits of of the methylene blue outside of just taking it for general health and wellness. Like there's applications where it's, I've seen improvements in my life from exercising. And then even if you don't necessarily want to be the person that takes methylene blue every day, I'm a huge proponent of like people should have this in their cabinet. So if you, again, begin to feel sick, like this is one of the, if not the best things you can start to take to like nip it in the bud. You don't get sick. All of a sudden you're not missing days at work. You're not missing productivity. And in general, you're just feeling better. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. I it's So it's in my emergency kit. I think everybody, I think it should be part of everybody's emergency kit. And I, I use, I'm also pretty, pretty healthy, thankfully overall, but I still, the last for board examinations in family medicine. Every every quarter, I would take 25 of these board exam questions. And so I do my little biohacking because we can take these at home now. They're timed. But part of that regimen is red light therapy <laughs> and methylene blue. And the first few quarters that I did those tests, I, I mean, I always do okay. But the moment I started biohacking it, so to speak, oh my gosh, my <laughs> scores were so much higher. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Um, I, I owe it a lot to methylene blue and red lights. And yeah. just so in it's just an, another example of someone healthy still seeing benefits for myself from a neurotropic yeah. standpoint. And just for people listening, like if you have an issue, like let's say you're dealing with a thyroid condition like Hashimoto's or or what have you. Is it safe to say methylene blue can play a role? Because again, we're talking about metabolic dysfunction or mitochondrial dysfunction, and that's where the methylene blue is going to go. So is that kind of a safe thing to say, or are there some caveats to that? I think it's very safe to say that. There's not really a lot of reasons that I would say don't use methylene blue at this point, or at least try it and see what happens. Technically, supposed to say as a pregnant person, don't use it, right? Breastfeeding, don't use it. Yep. In also, reality, you... would I have my own wife do it? She's not pregnant. Thank goodness. We have three kids and we don't want more. <laughs> I I would have no qualms with it at this point. I, I had heard some comments micro, when you're microdosing, when people are microdosing or using any psychotropic kind of good, stuff. That's good, a good, good question. Yeah. Okay. So I was very curious. So 
Methylene blue can be, act as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which basically raises serotonin in the body. And so if you're on some kind of antipsychotic that could also be doing the same, have the same mechanism of action, there's this potential where we could be doing too much of that. And then people might have serotonin syndrome type of effects. Now, when I looked back, that research was based off of people who were being having their parathyroids operated on and methylene blue was literally being poured on them during surgery. So they were in those in that huge, huge dosage range. I have not I I haven't seen any other literature and I haven't actually heard anybody who has had that experience. So whether it's being on an antidepressant or antipsychotic, I am not sure as long as we are talking about reasonable dosing, which I would call somewhere in the, you know, one milligram to a hundred milligrams sort of range. I don't think that it's actually something to worry about. You know, the, the, the medicine is in the dose, right? Oh, and- yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yoshi, I was, that made me ponder when I was reading about that, that, you know, I've done some study with Dr. Walsh's psychiatric nutrient use of, for psychiatric disorders. And about 8% of our population is not under-methylized, but over-methylized. So when I was reading about the MAO inhibitor and, and upping the serotonin, I was just wondering, you know, there are about 8% of the people who do worse on a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And mm-hmm. I didn't know if maybe that would be the person that maybe might have, a, I don't know, I'm just kind con- Yeah, I- so it would definitely be something where I would be very cognizant and I would start low and then just kind of work up to whatever we thought a therapeutic dose was. But again, on on a low, on what I would call a low dose of methylene blue in the four to third 20 or 30 milligrams a day, I, I sincerely doubt that would be an issue. The other part of it is that, like, I think so many of these psychiatric or mood situations are also due to a lack of energy a lack of energy at the mitochondrial and cellular level. And so if you give someone more energy, give someone more ATP, suddenly their brain's going to turn on just from an energetic standpoint, ATP energy, energetic standpoint. And so I have also found that it has helped mood. That it definitely does in folks. Gosh, that actually brings... I, I had a patient in about maybe two or three weeks ago at this point. And she, uh, this was like a year, I hadn't seen her in over a year. And she's like, by the way, you remember like a year and a half ago when I had that UTI and I you recommended I come in for the IV methylene blue. She's like, I did that. And my mood, I was like happy. Like I had never been before, not never been, but she has three little kids, so very stressed and just kind of on the lower mood side of things. She said for a few days, she was just, her mood was so elevated in a positive manner. And I was just like, oh, wow. That was just one more thing. Like, wow, the potential here, right? Good. You, you know, that is a segue into, you were talking about just in general health, you had a question for Dr. Mike about the sequencing of red light therapy, ozone, and methylene blue. You know, a lot of mm-hmm. different practitioners, I do a lot of ozone therapy with UVB light in my practice. And, and then, you know, sometimes we'll follow it up with a vitamin C. Some people have that reversed. You know, there's there's really not been a real strong protocol that people are following. And we're just, I think we should have just a, a little talk about that real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, I would, I would love to hear your, um, if you have any input, I don't know how familiar you are with ozone just as a little, like right now, I, we just started running a study in my office where the first session they're doing, let me get this right. We're doing MAH and then second session, and we're doing before and after blood work. The second session they're doing MAH plus the UBI. So the light therapy. And then the third 
one they're doing MAH UBI with 10 milligrams of methylene blue, and then fourth one it's tw- with 20 milligrams of methylene blue, and then fifth one it's with 30 milligrams of methylene blue. And yeah, I'm just kind of curious. We're kind of looking at some of the inflammatory markers for right now. You do now. that on the same patient or on different patients? Same patient. So a patient uh-huh. has to sign up for the full course. Okay, and, and, and those are divided into weekly? Yeah, uh, once or twice a week. Okay. And I, I prefer a, once a week. Wouldn't there be a sort of an additive effect over time anyway? There very well could be. Yeah. And I would hope that'll be sorted is. out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's, yeah. Yeah. We are, we're a small office. So we're definitely, it's not a perfectly designed study, but it'll be a starting point. So, know. and then you're doing the methylene blue with the IV, I take it. Yeah. Correct. And then, and then you're, you're adding the red light therapy. With um, n- not in this, not in this little study oh, okay. protocol. No, oh. sorry. Because you guys are both, <laughs> you guys are both okay. familiar with combining okay. all of that together. And we were just we wanted your opinion, Mike, on the order of things in terms of red light at the very end when the methylene blue is in the system, or methylene well, blue. But for, first, because I can go back and forth in my own head <laughs> about yeah, which is better. Me too. Well, I think that's like the million dollar question. I've, and I've had this similar discussion with on my podcast with Dr. Jason Somers years ago at this point. He's kind of one of the leading experts in, in hyperbaric ox- oxygen therapy. Mm-hmm. And we discussed the same question. It's like, so if you're doing red light therapy and HBOT, like which one should go first? And like there's some theoretical thought processes, but like n- nothing's proven in the research. Like no one's going to pay to have that research done likely. So it's kind of just semantics or just thinking about it physiologically i think we we in that discussion we we decided hbot first because i believe that causes vasoconstriction so then when you come out and do red light therapy which causes vasodilation maybe that's the better order but again it's like i think you could try both ways and like n equals one what feels better to a given person right yeah so i would kind of say a similar situation here well it's not the same because it's we're talking about photodynamic properties now so I would think you would want to take the methylene blue first based on peak concentration taking about 60 to 120 minutes. In a perfect world, you could have that person take methylene and then do the red light therapy one to two hours later to get the full benefit of methylene blue plus red light therapy, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Now, with doing, it, feasible, with, but... with doing it intravenously, do you think that the time would be squeeze down a little bit oh most certainly and that's the other caveat with leucomethylene blue since it's not that dark blue pigment traditionally it's going to be less of a photodynamic opportunity with red light therapy Hmm. so if you were going to do red light therapy plus methylene blue you want to use methylene blue not leuco wow that's interesting and makes sense okay i also get confused just saying that because it's like if the body breaks methylene blue down into leuco then like what's happening with the photodynamic property so right you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where m- my mind would go as well. And I also have a question for you, Yoshi, just on that exact topic is, and I heard this from a different person on a podcast. They said that methylene blue concentration is 100x in the central nervous system relative to everywhere else. And I think that just speaks to the mitochondrial density, yeah. of course. But with that being said, since this, the peak spectra of the photodynamic properties of methylene blue is around that 660 or so. Mm -hmm. If it's in your brain and red light can't get to your brain, does the near infrared light have an effect even though it's so much? Yeah. So I was, yeah, great question. So in my practice, we actually do, we like usually if we're giving someone IV methylene blue, we will, we'll have a red infrared light, a little kind of blanket Mm -hmm. or, pad, I guess, and put it over whatever our primary area of concern is, like a bladder and a UTI. But we also have this little cap with red and infrared light. And my idea was that, okay, if if so much of the blood flow goes to the brain, and then you have this mitochondrial rich tissue as well, if we can get light into and actually affect the methylene blue, it seems like a good thing. But that's correct. The red light is not going to penetrate the skull, or at least very little of it will. And so 
I did spend a decent amount of time looking into it. And from my understanding, the infrared spectrums that will are much more likely to penetrate the skull also are affecting methylene blue. So, and, and that's, Mm. that's the other thing. Methylene blue is from my understanding actually affected by a whole, like a plethora of wavelengths it's just the peak is 660 670 nanometers but it's actually affected by all of the yellows oranges reds you know into the purples and violets and um and then that infrared spectrum as well so yeah have you found anything on that is that no no i haven't found anything specific but i have noticed that like other pieces of research or otherwise people have been purporting that wavelengths outside of red light you can get photodynamic activity so so that matches and, and it definitely those, those wavelengths definitely affect the mitochondria like exactly. different cytochromes in the mitochondria so even if we're not truly like exciting the methylene blue we're still improving the mitochondria at the same time that methylene blue is in, right. in improving the mitochondrial efficiency as well so i kind of figure okay we're not going to lose on this situation probably but my understanding is that the infrared light spectrum, or at least a portion of it, affects the methylene blue too. So taking methylene blue and getting some sunshine is probably a good one-two punch. Oh my God. I think <laughs> that that's like... <laughs> Could be the yes. best. I think that's one of the best therapies. I, oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. I also, for myself on the days... So I lived down in San Diego. So last summer I tested the methylene blue... I think it was 60 milligrams to see if I would get sunburned. <laughs> I didn't put sunscreen on. I don't know if I, that was a wise test or not, <laughs> but uh, it it definitely helped. You know, it was like I did not get sunburned. I, my skin, skin still got that like rosy glow. But yeah, that was kind of interesting. It mm-hmm. definitely, it was like a natural sunscreen for me. Now that's, that's not, like please blue. everyone don't, yeah. Please, everybody, don't go out and burn yourself trying this. But um, well, kind of similar to astaxanthin, right? Like you can ingest astaxanthin, and that'll lengthen. Yeah, it can be on the sunshine before yeah. getting that urethemic response. Yeah, exactly. But the astaxanthin, that's more of like antioxidant, right? Right. Um, versus the methylene blue, it's like that antioxidant plus a lot of other mechanisms for health. Yep. So. Yeah, I don't know. I'll try it more this summer too. Um, One other thing that we need to talk about too is Mike has the calculations aspect Mm -hmm. on his website. I think it's really important to talk about that. He's developing that so that um, he's he's just pouring through the research and figuring out distance and time in terms of treatment for red light therapy. And so people can actually take their their malady and then be able to... uh, utilize the red light therapy in the most utmost therapeutic way. And I just wanted to mention that because I think that that's really right on the edge, you know, in terms of getting some perfection in in the treatment. So did you get, did you happen to look at that Yoshi, that, that calculation page on his website? I did. I find that super fascinating. (laughs) And I, I, I just, I saw the little calculator button and I was just like, wow, this, this guy's doing something cool. Well, for full transparency, that calculator page is extremely in its beta version. What I've been doing for months and months now, like Katie alluded to, is combing through the thousands and thousands of studies and then finding the ones that had positive benefits. And essentially, Yoshi, so I've created, to backpedal a moment, I've created a pretty nice resource of like nice red light therapy information, like what is it, how does it work, how should a person use it? What is it good for? And then as a person in the red light therapy space, when I first entered five years ago, and I think still to this day, it's it's widely the ubiquitously given recipe is you need to do red light therapy for 20 to 30 minutes every day. And after looking through the research, it didn't take long to realize like, what if you're treating anti-aging skin? What if you're treating your brain? What if you're black? What if you're white? What if you're sick? What if you're like, it just didn't make sense on the face of it after a while. So then it got me curious to start developing protocols. So if a person had a device and you're trying to treat, you know, X, Y, Z condition, you could be a little more specific and theoretically more effective and efficacious with your treatment. 
because I still think even to this day, there's there's a relative dearth of of quality red light therapy education out there. It's like people are paying thousands of dollars for handheld devices or panels or what have you. And a lot of times I don't think people know how to properly use them, which back to our discussion of it being safe and effective and like low risk, high reward. I think as long as you're getting consistent exposure, like as a global blanketed statement, if you're getting consistent exposure to red and near infrared light, whether it's a device or the sun, you're probably going to see health benefits. But again, if you want to be kind of a sniper approach, that does necessitate specific protocols and especially for physicians. And as I've talked to more and more physicians over the years, it's like they want to know like if a patient walks in exactly how to use their device and that information is just not out there now. Mm -hmm. So to continue the story, I have developed this ebook, which has gone through four or five iterations now, which have these specific protocols, but those protocols are predicated on a specific light irradiance. Meaning if you had like a handheld device or a more powerful device, which I think that's up for debate unless it's third-party tested, you would have to, as the user, do some mathematics to alter the protocol I've given to make it make sense for the device you have. Because what I give is use red and or near infrared light at X amount of distance for X amount of minutes, right? So I try to like do the math for the people based on the research. But again, it was like for a specific light irradiance. And it dawned on me maybe a year ago at this point that there needs to be like an ecosystem of sorts where regardless of what product you have, what type of product size, regardless of what company it's from, there needs to be this, again, I call it an ecosystem where people can build their protocol based on what they're trying to treat, regardless of what device they're using, if that makes sense. So to bring this full circle again, that calculator page has two variables. That's all you need to spit out like this full protocol. You need to know what the light or radiance of your device is. And that's where this whole educational point of your product needs to be third party tested because it's become very clear and it's been proven that if it's not third party tested, the light irradiance is almost assuredly overinflated by a lot. Mm. And we're talking about the popular red light therapy companies out there. There's is that no overinflated in terms of joules or milliwatts per centimeter squared? Okay, that's what light irradiance is. Okay, so the panel they can they can say on their website it's 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared, but when it's been tested it's closer to like 70 or 80. Some people say it's 150. Again, it's down in like the 70s or 80s. So like from a marketing ploy, and I noticed this early on, the marketing was saying that your device or your panel was the most powerful on the market. And again, maybe it's just an American mindset that we think more is better. So it's easy to get caught up in this hype of oh, this company has the highest light rate or like the most powerful device. So like, I need that. But again, why? Or like, what does that mean? Again, to your point, Yoshi, with methylene blue, it's like the devil's in the dosage. So again, back to the calculator, <laughs> you need two variables. You need the light irradiance. But again, it needs to be accurate, hopefully. And the light irradiance will also tell you your distance because that's part of a light irradiance measurement is it was measured at zero inches. It was measured at six inches. It was measured at 12 inches. So you know your distance based on the light irradiance measurement you would have to find for your device. And then the second variable you need to know is the joules, which is like, so how many joules was necessary that this study showed for you to get positive anti-aging skin benefits or thyroid health benefits? And again, that's what I'm combing through the research is I'm looking at all this different research and seeing, you know, how many joules did it take for them to see a positive result for X, Y, and Z? So this compendium I've built up has like a couple hundred conditions, we can say, whereas my initial or my, my current ebook has like a couple dozen. So what I've built is people are going to have this resource, which is going to be like hundreds and hundred or a couple hundred uh, conditions that will have all the joules. It'll tell you which wavelengths we're using the, the research. So, you know, if it's red and or near infrared. And then you just need to know the light radiance of your device. So this ecosystem, like Kitty was alluding to, hopefully becomes somewhat ubiquitous in the red light therapy space because it doesn't matter which brand, what type or size, you should be able to use this calculator and it's going to spit out the duration of your treatment. That is so valuable. I mean, that's that's really awesome. Thank you for doing that. Because that's 
it's like, you know, like it's, it's one, one dosage does not fit everyone. Same, same thing. And then also it's something like 30% of all nutraceutical bottles out there don't have the dosage that they say is on the bottle. Right. Same. Sounds like it's the same thing in the, in the photobiomodulation industry. Right. Yep. So yeah. Thanks for bringing some honesty and a good quality guidance to, to physicians and, and <laughs> consumers. Yeah, and really developing the science of, of it all so that we can utilize it not only at home, but in our clinics, get, get better results. So we're going to really be watching for that, that whole page for you to develop that. Yeah, I'm hoping to have that whole thing released by the end of the month. There's always delays, but again, that's my goal. And that, that calculator page, I'll have some education on it so people know how to use it. Education on why third-party testing is important. And then for those who have BioLite devices, I'll list all of the light irradiances on that page so you don't have to go search for it yourself. It'll be there. But then, yeah, as long as you have that resource, it's just an easy you know, search find and plug in your two variables and you'll get your protocol. Nice. That's, that's so great. There's this so powerful. It goes back to like the beginning of the conversation where you're talking about the individual who was coming up with the violet yeah. packaging, right? And frequencies. I mean, this is a huge area. You're you're much more of a light expert than I am, but the more I learn about light waves and frequencies, the more I think that that's really who we are. It's like we're this sack of what H2O, minerals, amino acids fats, and then light. And I think the light is what kind of huge part of the, what puts us all together and makes us hum along properly. It's all frequencies, so, right? It's all frequencies. And it's, 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 it's mind boggling once you start kind of going down that rabbit hole. So it's a big cool rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, a very big <laughs> rabbit hole. And it's going to go on for a long, long time. So thanks for bringing some clarity to it. Yeah, so, my pleasure. Yeah. Well, it's really great talking to the two of you. And I like uh, skating. Appreciate yeah, you, you guys coming in here together and and talking about all this. Maybe, you know, circle back round sometime. But is there anything else that you guys want to add? No, I have one thing that I want to add. Yeah. We were talking about methylene blue and its dosage and whether, you know, as a naturopathic physician over 37 years, always using everything natural. And I was talking to Yoshi about the fact that, you know, when I was a classical homeopath, it was just classical homeopathy. I do that now, but I do it with everything else that it wasn't, it, there wasn't so much in my, in the environment that I had to deal with back 40 years ago. So when I started researching methylene blue, I started almost looking at it homeopathically where smaller doses will create a response and then if you take it, the dose too far, just like anything where you can, the similimum, you can create toxicity from it. And so I started thinking about, wow, we've actually entered this age where we have to create something synthetic to kind of be able to uh, modulate or manage the all the synthetics that we're exposed to. That's kind of like where my head goes with it. Maybe I'm rationalizing it, but I do see that it's it's really effective. And so I'm just I just wanted to throw that out, you know, sort of philosophically where I'm kind of going with all of that. Fighting fire with fire in a sense. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's one it's one tool in the toolbox, right? And it's I think your audience is probably are already pretty familiar. You want to be doing all of the lifestyle stuff as well as possible right mm -hmm. and but then to have methylene blue something like methylene blue in your toolbox it can be extremely helpful especially like you just alluded to and you know like i was saying earlier it's like we live in a very toxic world and so to fight fire with a little bit of fire uh, sure seems appropriate i have a couple of questions yoshi or maybe they're kind of the same question have you seen any anecdotal response or heard of positive results with methylene blue and fighting cancer and then same thing with eye health so i've heard about the eye health potential there i have yet to go down that rabbit hole so i have not i have not recommended it to anybody i actually have so i'm a sticky note person kind of guy and on my sticky note on my to-do list is i want to make 
some eye drops for myself and then try it on myself and and go from there because it interesting it makes sense because those the 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 tissue over like on the surface of the eyeball turns over so frequently so it's got to be like very metabolically active right and so to me it just kind of makes sense that methylene blue could be very useful but have yet to use that the cancer now that's interesting I have, so I have spoken to a few other doctors who have used it and have sworn that it has made a big difference. I have, I have yet to, we do see a lot of cancer in our office. I have yet to make that kind of a cornerstone, mostly because it's like different types of cancers do behave differently. And so I don't want to just throw methylene blue right off the bat at all types of them. I want to get a little bit more clear with myself about which types it might make more sense compared to others where it might not make as much sense, or there might just be better options out there because cancer is so tricky. Like you want to really get at it from as many angles as possible. And so usually it's like, it's more like, okay, here's these 30 things we want to do. Is this, should methylene blue be in one of those? And I imagine it should be but I don't know. So I, I just don't have enough expertise on that front. Yeah, it's kind of the wild, wild west in that sense. Do you have any particular situations where you'd be adverse to it in, in the cancer realm, like where it just doesn't make sense or it might even be contraindicated in a, in a sense? I mean, maybe depending on what kind of chemotherapy somebody was on, potentially. So I'd want to look at the mechanism of action of a, of a certain type of anti-cancer drug that someone would be on and then just kind of think things through logically. Cause again, there's, it's not like there's research out there, right? but it was like the, it's like IV vitamin C or IV ascorbic acid in cancer. It's like, sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it matches really well with certain anti-cancer drugs. Other times it doesn't match up very well. Um, so I think I'd, I just want to really think that through. I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't throw it just categorically. Somebody who's not on anti-cancer drugs already might make, might, it probably makes a lot of sense. That's yeah. where my mind goes, but I just don't know. Gotcha. Yeah. Metabolically, it makes sense, but there's, yeah, there's yeah. so many moving parts, especially yeah. when you throw in chemo, radiation, all that stuff. It would yeah. seem like, but to your point, you don't know how they're going to mix and match, but seems like if you're killing your cells with with chemo and radiation methylene blue would seem like a good antidote to that to a certain degree but again how they mix and match it that's a whole different story that's out of my realm yeah and i just you know part of it it's like if someone's going to be on an anti-cancer drug through an oncologist i i and that was their decision because i'm not for myself in my practice i'm like I'll have a conversation and explain all the potential pros and cons that I'm aware of and and guide the person to make their decision. Do they want to do all natural? Do they want to do a combination? Or maybe like some people, they've, they're just straight up, they want to go totally the allopathic route. And so it's just like this conversation to figure out what's right for the person, which direction they want to take. If someone is more on the like combination front, I don't want to take methylene blue and inactivate the chemotherapy potentially or the radiation or whatnot so i just or maybe it's the discussion with the patient and say hey i don't know but methylene blue does do all of this stuff and then at least they're going in eyes wide open right i think that's so that's so important i like my patients to be as educated as possible i don't know everything and sometimes it's just a journey and maybe there's certain markers where we could check. So maybe there's, depending how fast it's progressing or not progressing or how stable it is, maybe we do some uh, testing and then take methylene blue for a month or two and and see where we're at, right? So, yeah, it's an interesting frontier. Yeah, definitely. Where, where do you go for um, keeping up to date with methylene blue research? Do you just use PubMed or is there somewhere else? Yeah. No, I'm I'm PubMed. Gotcha. Guy. Yeah. Or, you know, obviously I listen to a lot of podcasts. So if I hear something, then I'll go to PubMed and kind yeah. of type in that keyword. Yeah. Um, and then obviously sifting through literature is 
a whole different beast, right? <laughs> yep. Can't go by just the headline. <laughs> In fact, don't ever go by the headline. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it goes for news articles too. Well, I appreciate your insight, Yoshi. This, is, this has been a fun conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for hopping on. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Really appreciated having you guys here. Thanks so much for all your knowledge and your inspiration. Thanks for having us, Katie. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolight. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.